Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon. I am not here with Geeky Sparkles in this video, but that's okay. She didn't watch uh, this show. We're going to talk about X-Men 97, my first reaction, my initial reaction to the first two episodes. Um, this is coming from someone who's a longtime X-Men fan and who has a soft spot for the 92 animated series and has been cautiously optimistic about this show, given some of the stuff that uh, showrunner, former showrunner Bo DeMeo had said about honoring and respecting the legacy of the franchise. And that gave me hope. <laughs> so I've been quietly holding out hope that this show would be good. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to give my reaction to it. Having sat through the first two episodes, I'll probably do spoiler free at first, and then I'll get into more spoiler territory. So before I get into it any further, please subscribe for more pop culture news views and rants. Guys, no woohoos in this video. Uh, if you want the audio version of Clownfish TV, you can go out to Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, we, we do have an audio version of all of our episodes out there, actually. So if you're in the car, you can listen to us. Uh, as you're driving and not have to watch us bob up and down endlessly. But uh, let's talk about this. Uh, I've been looking forward to this show. Unfortunately, it has been marred by controversy. Uh, Bo DeMeo got gone. He's, he's the uh, showrunner and the writer of the first two episodes, I believe. And he got gone uh, like last week or the week before, right before the premiere, was not invited to the premiere. So we've got that controversy. We don't know exactly why. I've heard multiple theories. Uh, one of the theories is that his only fans took a turn for the, I guess it got, it got a little more adult than what Disney was led to believe. Uh, the other, the other theory is that he was difficult to work for. Uh, I know a lot of people were kind of gunning for Bo DeMeo, especially after he worked on the Witcher and he made it known that uh, he was not happy about changes from the book and the video game. Uh, to the Netflix show, and he backed up Henry Cavill, and that's a, a cardinal sin now, I guess. But whatever the reason is, it definitely has has marred um, has marred the uh, uh, reaction, I think, to the show because I'm concerned that going forward, uh, after his run, the show's not going to be as good. And yeah, the show is good. The show is really damn good, and I'm shocked that this came out of Disney. And I think it's because of Bo DeMeo that the show is this good. And I'm hoping to God whatever he did was not terrible because I don't want to have to think about it like I do Dan Schneider, right? <laughs> like every time, like our kids loved iCarly and they loved uh, those those uh, Schneider shows on Nickelodeon. And now I got to think of like all the drama with, with Dan Schneider uh, every time you know, we mention iCarly, which sucks. So let's, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, this is X-Men 97. X-Men 97 is a follow-up to the original 1990s animated X-Men series that was on Fox Kids. And, and that show had to go through a lot to get picked up because back then, superheroes weren't that popular. But this show, the original version of the show, really cemented the X-Men, I think, in the pop culture consciousness. And you, you can watch an interview I did with uh, Art T-Bear, who worked on these books, worked on the X-Men books in the 90s, uh, you can listen to that podcast, the D-Res podcast. And uh, it's pretty interesting to listen to some inside baseball of what was going on uh, at Marvel Comics, at least, during this era. And it is amazing that the original show got made at all. That being said, the original show uh, had its drawbacks. One of the, the biggest drawbacks was the animation. I didn't think the animation was that good. Like you put the original X-Men series up against Batman, the animated series, and even Spider-Man, which was also you know, on Fox at the time. And it's very clear that X-Men was the worst animated show out there. That being said, the storylines were good. The music was kick-ass. That theme song, like if they don't use that in the Marvel movies going forward, it's, it's a massive missed opportunity. But what we're getting with X-Men 97... And the closest thing I can think of to compare it to is probably G.I. Joe Resolute. What we're getting is like an idealized version of the X-Men show you think you watched as a kid. That being said, this X-Men show is not for kids. This is obviously for adult fans of that franchise. It's not super adult, right? 
but they do swear a couple of times. It does deal, I think, with more adult themes. Um, the dialogue is like very reminiscent of dialogue that you would find in Marvel comics from the eighties, nineties. Some people are criticizing that. I, I think it's great. <laughs> it's very like some of it's very on the nose, but like I, I felt like I was watching a Marvel comic that I grew up reading as a kid, if that, if that makes sense. But this is very much an idealized version of what you thought you were watching. The animation is Way better. I, I don't know why people were complaining about the animation. I don't know if the people that were watching this are either really just, they're so used to anime or they don't watch a lot of animation, but the animation was actually done by studio mirror, which is one of the best animation studios out there for 2d animation. Now, is there some of it that looks kind of computery? Yeah. Why is that? They're probably using Toon boom which is kind of the standard now for 2D animation. But people were trying to say that it was like cell shaded and it was 3D. No, no, this is hand-drawn animation. This is the studio that did uh, Avatar and Korra. And, uh, you know, it, it's actually very good. They were holding back because the best animated scenes in this series are the action scenes. And they're amazing. There are some really, really good scenes and you're not, seeing them because it gives too much of the plot away. But, uh, you know, when, when they're on, they're on actually the, the worst animated parts are when they're just kind of sitting around talking, which they don't do a lot of. Thankfully there, there is a lot of action in every episode. Well, there have only been two episodes, but it feels like a self-contained comic book. It feels like this was a 22 page comic that you would have picked up in the eighties and nineties. And I appreciate that. Bo DeMeo obviously knows his shit. He knows, he knows the X-Men. There are a lot of Easter eggs for fans of eighties, nineties X-Men. It seems like they kind of put a lot of it in a blender, but the original series did that too. The original series did things kind of out of order from how they were in the comics. And they did things with different X-Men because the, the team makeup was reflective of Jim Lee's team in the, 90s. But sometimes they go back, they do, you know, Dark Phoenix, but with the 90s team instead of the 80s team, you know, and Jubilee is a stand in for Kitty Pride, And, you know, so, you know, you kind of see that and you have to understand that where they're coming from. But my God, it was it was actually really good. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually shocked. I, I feel the same way about this that I felt about Picard season three, where it's a bright spot in an otherwise uh, dull, grim, corporate IP landscape where Star Trek as a franchise uh, was missing the mark, but Picard, because of the showrunner, was was done really well. And it was only season three, season one and two. And eh, I didn't really, I didn't watch more than a couple episodes of season one because I knew it was going to make me angry and I've got enough to be angry about. But, um, but Picard season three was fantastic. And I felt after watching that, that if that was the last Star Trek anything I ever watched, I was good. I was good to go. It was a proper ending for the Next Generation crew. And now we're only two episodes into this, and I, I could totally be like, oh, my God, they dropped the ball. That is, that is possible. That is very possible. So just don't throw this back in my face in, you know, in six weeks or whatever when the show's done. But from what I've seen of this so far, Bo DeMeo and crew get it. Uh, they get it. They get the X-Men. He obviously read the comics. He obviously watched the show. Uh, you know, it's not like we have, uh, you know, as Marvel's been doing, they're just like pulling random people off the street and being like, hey, we're going to put you in charge of this franchise. And, and they try to twist the franchise and the characters to fit their uh, current year ideology or, or, or notion of what the characters actually should be. The characters are themselves. Uh, everybody's acting like themselves. Now, speaking of themselves, I, I guess we could talk about Morph uh, quickly. Um, Morph is barely in it, at least in these two episodes. And is Morph non-binary? I think based on the credit sequence where they go through and they, they talk about the, the mutant's powers, you know, like they did in the old series and they click on the mutant and then it says what, what their powers were. And they do refer to Morph as their in the credits but they never refer, refer to Morph as they, them on air, it, at least in these two episodes. They might have a very special episode with Morph later on. I have no idea. 
But in these two episodes, Morph is barely there, and Morph is there basically to provide some pretty kick-ass action scenes. Uh, there's there's one scene in which Morph turns into a bunch of different X-Men that are not on the team, including, I guess it's a spoiler, including Colossus and Psylocke, and it's it's especially Psylocke, the animation is is fucking fantastic. It's, it's, it's really, really good. So I'm like, I, I don't want to hear anybody. If you actually watch the episodes, I don't want to hear, I, I'm still getting it again, but I don't want to hear complaints <laughs> about the animation. Cause that a couple of these sequences are really, really well done. And the, uh, the scene with Psylocke and, and Colossus, uh, morph as Psylocke and Colossus, I thought were done really, really well, but yeah, obviously they're mashing up a bunch of different storylines. Um, we've got Magneto in his eighties costume and he's on trial. And I guess that's spoiler territory. But um, before I, I guess before I get into that, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I, I held off on jumping into the fray with the non-binary morph and the rogue's ass and the, you know, all this other stuff. We mentioned it offhandedly, but, you know, I, I was quietly holding out hope um, for the show, again, based on Bo DeMeo and the stuff he said. And he's a man of his word. I mean, I don't know what went down that you got fired, but he's a man of his word. He actually understands these characters. He knows what fans of longtime fans of the franchise are looking for. And uh, he did a respectful update to the original series. In fact, this is better than what you remember. The animation's better than, uh, and again, very much in the way of, of G.I. Joe Resolute, where it was kind of sort of a sequel to the 80s G.I. Joe cartoon, but a much more uh, grown-up version of that with much better animation. That's that's actually the closest comparison I can think, and it works. I mean, it works. Uh, I, I think it's fantastic. And if, if people are, are uh, you know, again, complaining about the animation, go back and watch the original show, okay? It, it didn't age as well as you think it, it did. And I'm being honest. I love that show. I love that show. But I would actually say that other... Marvel shows like Spider-Man and his amazing friends and even Dungeons and Dragons and early trans transformers earlier GI Joe. Uh, I think they aged better. The animation aged better than the next men did. Sorry, but the show itself is actually really good. And I thought it was a, a pretty good representation of X-Men on the small screen. It is amazing that it got made at all. So that is, that is that part. Um, I would actually, if I had to grade it ju just these two episodes, I'd easily given eight or nine out of 10. I had a couple of small nitpicks, but they were very, very minor. I mean, this is much better than I thought it was going to be. And I know this is going to piss people off. I know people are going to get pissed off that I like this show. I had people get pissed off that I like Picard, you know, uh, season three. And I hated the first couple episodes of season one. But, you know, you're allowed to hate the show. You want to hate the show. You don't want to watch the show. You don't want to give Disney your money or whatever the reason is you are allowed to. Fantastic. I'm just telling you, that current year, this is probably the best case scenario for us. In fact, I would say this is probably the best damn X-Men anything we've had in 10 years, comic book or animated or otherwise. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what Disney does with the franchise and live action, but I, d I have a strong suspicion it's not going to be as respectful to the source material as, as this show is and this might be the last raw. Might be like, yep, this is the last time you're going to get the classic X Men lineup and classic X Men, and then we're going to turn it into the mutants or the X Them's or whatever the hell you know they're going to do with it in live action. I hope they're smart enough to avoid that because the buzz around the show has actually been pretty good. In fact, uh, Rotten Tomatoes, I think it's got 100 percent and 92 percent audience score. I can't click on this though, so I have no idea who's who's rating this or what. So yeah, I just want to get that out of the way first. I guess we'll uh, we'll talk more about spoilers. Like I said, it is a mashup of different storylines. We've got um, you know Magneto in charge of the X Men. We've got uh, Storm with her '80s mohawk, but her '90s outfit, which is kind of weird. Uh, we've got the Executioner in there. We've got the birth of uh, Cable, um, and I think Mister Sinister is supposed to be the big bad of this season, which probably is why they brought morph back. Um, but yeah, I thought I, I I'm going to be honest. I, this doesn't happen very often, but I'm like, thank God 
they got this one right. And um, it, this is definitely the best case scenario, I think. Um, what's going to be weird about this show being as good as I believe it is, is that the Marvel Comics reboots are going to look so much worse by comparison. I can almost guarantee you. Like, this is, this is the X-Men that people want. If you're going to get people back on board with the X-Men, if you're going to get old heads like myself back on board with the X-Men, this is how you do it. And I think Marvel Comics is going to completely fuck it up. <laughs> I think they are. just Based on what I've seen, it looks very bland. Like, this is what people... You bring us this lineup, and you, you take it back to basics, and you make sure all the characters are in character, and uh, just give us the basic you know, premise again. Yogare Bay off of Krakoa, which I guess they're finally doing after five years. But this, this is, this was X-Men at their peak. This is what it was like and what it should be and could be again. God, they have this uh, fight scene with the Sentinels and they're playing the music and the animation is just top notch. And it was, it was good. I'm just, I'm really, like I said, I, I feel good being able to say that because I don't say that much on this channel anymore because I'm so used to every, uh, franchise I grew up loving being completely bastardized. So I'm pleasantly surprised when things are good. And again, this is just the first two episodes, but I'm on board, you know? Um, and now I'm highly concerned about the Bo DeMeo situation. I gotta tell you, cause I'm like, if it was really, really bad, uh, you know, that's definitely going to cast a shadow, uh, over this, but, um, yeah, I mean, regardless of whatever he did, he he did good work here. And I guess we get two seasons of this and then, you know, they're going to change it up for the third season and uh, I don't I don't have a lot of, if there is a third season, but I don't have a lot of hope. <laughs> you know, I I really don't have a lot of hope uh, cuz I think the only reason this works is cuz he's actually uh, you know, the guy steering the ship. So, yeah, um it's not hard to make fans happy. And we see a lot of this now that there's a lot of intentional antagonism of, of fandoms. And I don't think it's hard to make fans happy. You just basically give them characters that act in character. You do it well. You try not to shove politics down their throats. That's a big one. I mean, the X-Men is an outlier though, because, okay, so here, th this is, this is one of the things that I, I found, um, uh, pleasantly refreshing about the X-Men because the premise of the X-Men has always been that uh, Charles Xavier wants everyone to learn to peacefully coexist. That doesn't mean everybody gets along. That doesn't mean everybody agrees with everybody. You know, uh, it doesn't mean that people who take it too far shouldn't be reprimanded for that or dealt with for the greater good or whatever, but they deal with politics in this episode in a pretty even handed way, uh, Magneto's trial, he basically said that and I'm paraphrasing here. I don't have the quote off the top of my head cause I can't, I can't pull anything up because Disney won't let you with Disney plus, but he basically says that the oppressed become the oppressors, even if you play by their rules. And, uh, I thought that was, that was a pretty interesting, uh, pretty damning statement. Because it wasn't like, I, I think if you had somebody that wasn't familiar with the source material in charge of this show, it would be like, the mutants are always right. They're always right. They're always persecuted. And the humans are the bad people. And the mutants are always right. And they should do whatever they have to do. And basically, everybody needs to side with Magneto, which is very different. Because back in the day, Magneto was a villain. And, you know, his his growth, which I'm sure will get reverted because that does in the comics, but his, his growth in this episode is that he's like, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we, maybe we need to, uh, try to get along. Maybe we need to, um, show humans that we're better than this, that we're not terrorists. Uh, maybe we need to, even if we don't agree with them, uh, try to help them, save them. Maybe they'll come around to realizing that we're not monsters after all. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And that's a very different attitude than the current political landscape, which is, your enemies are your enemies and you just obliterate them, you know, and the ends justify the means. And it doesn't matter what happens to them. It doesn't matter if there's collateral damage. It doesn't, you know, it's just, you're, you're, you're wiping out the other side and that's it. And the X-Men has always given us uh, a better 
I guess, better version of ourselves that, you know, there are some people out there that are just looking to coexist. They're not looking to obliterate the other side completely. And I think we need that now. I think we need that message now. And that message has been lost in the comics, <laughs> you know, for sure. I mean, it's like, I didn't read a whole lot of the Krakoa storyline because I thought it was just dumb. Uh, but, uh, you know, we need that message now because there's so much tribalism and there's so much, uh, you know, hatred and fires being stoked and, you know, pop culture is being used as a, as a hockey puck. Now it used to be something that we could enjoy together, even if, you know, we didn't necessarily agree. And that was a beautiful thing about Charles Xavier and Magneto, that they had a friendship, you know, even though they didn't agree with each other politically, uh, they were still able to respect one another and be friends and, you know, in, in Professor X's case, he was always hoping that Magneto would would come around because he knew somewhere in there was parts of a good person, right? <laughs> you know, his bits, a little bit of a good person in there somewhere. Uh, but, you know, and sometimes you you do hold out hope for people that just are hopeless. You know, and that's, I mean, anybody that's had a, a problematic family member, you know, maybe somebody that's like in and out of jail or on drugs or whatever, you know what I'm saying? You know, like you're always holding out hope because you love them. You're holding out hope that they will, uh, you know, get their life in order and, you know, become a better person and be the person that you think that they can be, the, be the person that you actually uh, see inside of them. But one thing that was really interesting, you know, speaking of Krakow, and I'm going to wrap it up here, um, was people were like, oh my God, they're going to have the mutant gala. Actually, it was funny. Um, yeah, there was a paper that was blowing through the air that had the mutant gala. It was after an explosion. And I took that to mean that they were blowing that shit up because that was never, there was no mutant gala. I don't think we're going to see Iceman strutting around in heels if he does show up at all. And if he does, I, I don't know if he's going to be gay or they're just not going to mention it. They actually do reference Iceman and they have the picture of the original five members, uh, you know, on the the painting on the wall in the mansion and Iceman with his boots <laughs> that was in the painting. I don't know if he's going to be in this series or not. Uh, he was barely in the original, which I thought was kind of weird, but um, yeah, I don't know guys. I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. And it makes me sad too, because I'm like, this is, this is what we should have been getting all along. This is what the X-Men should have been in the last 10 years. This is what the X-Men could be. And I just, I know Disney is going to, ruin it somehow. I know Marvel comics is going to ruin it somehow. It's not hard to get it right, but I think you have to be in the right frame of mind to be able to write good X-Men. And I think a lot of today's writers are not in the right frame of mind. Again, it's that, that tribalism. I think that we don't want to give people we disagree with the benefit of the doubt at all. We don't want to admit that, you know, the X-Men were trying to save humans, even though they were ingrates a lot of times um and that was that was a basic premise of the series that was the premise of the series and now it's like no we just you know we obliterate people that we don't agree with so i think the people that have been in charge of, of x-men in a lot of ways are, are magneto and uh you know the fans have walked away from it it's <laughs> it's not very good i don't i don't think i'm gonna be honest i don't think this reboot is going to do it justice. But if, if this is the last good X-Men thing that we ever get, I feel the same way um, as I do about Picard. I'm okay with it. If we can get a couple of good seasons out of this and it's solid and it reminds me of why I love these characters and love the comic series and the animated series back in the day and that's it and that's the last proper X-Men we ever get, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. You know, should at this point we should consider it a gift if every once in a while we get a showrunner that gets it, and uh, we did in this case. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say yeah, eight or nine out of ten based on the first two episodes. It could go south, you know, it could totally go south and just go off the rails. But I don't think it's going to, at least not with Bo DeMeo in charge. I think the episodes that could come after his run, yeah, they might go off the rails. But for now, it's it's pretty okay. It's all right. I'm gonna wrap it up. Please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants, and we'll talk later.